way initiatives can work within an institution is if people kind of take it up and put their own kind of spin on it. So, you know, a review, and I'm going to zip through this, and I want to make sure I'm good on time here. Um, we've organized ourselves into eight areas of study, right? Um, we've talked about the, we now have a first 15 for undecided students. We have area specific advising now. Advising has been redesigned, career coaching. Um, there have been some curricular reforms within specific areas. We're doing more, I think we're doing much better program review. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later and prioritization. And the state context, and this can't be underemphasized, is getting much better with respect to transfer um, specifically. So now students have to select an area, right? Um, if they're a matriculated student, they have to select an area and they're encouraged to select a program. And we're seeing now that, that now that we've taken away that kind of general studies bucket, students are doing a better job. We're, we're actually getting a clearer picture of what our students want to do at the outset. And that was obscured, I think, by the general studies degree before. So I think that's a good sort of outcome of the pathways work so far. Um, I'm not going to read through all of this, but advising has been uh, substantially redesigned. It's been grouped into areas of study. Um, and lead advisors are working with those area of study teams. Um, I think there's a lot better. I think one of the kind of unintended, but I think beneficial outcomes of the pathways work that I've had reported to me from area of study teams is that a lot of the faculty and academic administrators in those areas feel like they're maybe beginning to form better relationships with advising as a consequence of our restructuring. And I think that's a good thing. And I think what Ella um, Aho has done in career coaching has been magnificent. Um, they're really working with students, especially exploratory students, to get this kind of mandated intervention to really talk about not just what jobs are available, but what do you want to do? Really cultivating, again, a sense of student intentionality, um, helping them kind of set goals and think about how their goals match then SLCC programs that are available to them. Um, the curriculum, some of the things that have been done uh, that have been visible to me, although I think there's even more, you know, we talked, we've embedded some success modules into first year courses. Um, again, the first 15, some areas actually like health sciences created a new kind of intro to area course that I think has been interesting to sort of see. Um, you do see areas, I mean, this I think speaks to the kind of HSI theme of the day, but I think you see a lot of faculty in areas exploring how do we make our curriculum more culturally relevant um, and inclusive? Um, and we're beginning, uh, areas are beginning to revise how students sequence their first year, especially like, I think a good example, if you get a chance to talk to Jessica Curran um, in uh, arts and communication, they've scaffolded choice in that area in really interesting ways. And again, I think we've done better work with program review and prioritization. We discontinued um, some programs, uh, I think it was 11, about a year ago. And you know, part of the choice architecture sort of context for students is how many credentials we offer. And, and I will talk about that as well. I'm gonna stop for a moment and I'm gonna look at the chat. Jessica is in there. Thank you, Jessica, for putting some links. Um, I'll occasionally stop and pay attention to the chat. So if people have questions, feel free to um, throw something up in the chat. Another important part is just the broader state context. So um, under Rachel Lewis's leadership, um, we have done a lot with like transfer summits with the University of Utah, the reformation of the University Transfer Center. This is again in Rachel Lewis's area with director Lalani Clegg, who is awesome. And there's a lot of really great work happening there right now that's going to be beneficial for transfer in the coming years. Doubling down on university partnerships where a student can begin at SLCC and complete a four-year degree through Weber, uh, through UVU, through Utah State um, on our campus. I think there's a lot of potential with university partnerships uh, to kind of keep our students um, here. And I think we sometimes underestimate how far away, both geographically in some cases, but also just maybe how intimidating places like the University of Utah can be. And if we can keep our students here in a place that's familiar, how that might um, help them succeed and achieve that bachelor's. Um, we have emerging partnerships where it's gonna be the Harriman campus where we have about 
um, 11 programs we're going to partner with uh, with the University of Utah. And then emerging, you'll be hearing more about this West Side Initiative with the University of Utah as well in the coming years. Um, we do chief academic officer program review meetings. And I, in my um, couple of years of being a part of those meetings, I've seen better conversations about transfer happening in those meetings and better conversations about the composition of associate's degrees. And the fact that, for example, course numbers mean something. So if you're asking a student to take a class at the sophomore year, it should be a 2000 level course, right? Um, uh, if it's if you're asking a sophomore to take a 4000 level course in an associate, which we have seen examples of, well, that's that's a poor that's poor design. It's poor design within your institution, but it's also poor design at the state level. And then the tech colleges, I don't know if people realize this, have joined the Utah system of higher education and it's beginning to have some kind of downstream consequences for how we think about um, how we organize um, ourselves as an institution. So this year, so we had the introduction to Guided Pathways, a kind of brief review of what's been happening uh, at SLCC over the last five or six years. This year's charge was for this area of study design teams to begin to develop maps. Um, so they'll take the lead in developing their areas of study and their specific programs within the framework of Guided Pathways reform um, with a focus on program maps and forming area of study councils. So those area of study design teams have been meeting and working on that. Um, there was also a specific charge to the School of Humanities and Social Sciences to create what are called general transfer degrees. And this is coming out of some emerging Yushi policy around what is called direct versus general transfer. So humanities and social sciences have been working on um, a general transfer degree in humanities and a general transfer degree in social sciences. And then the English department is working sort of following, I think, the lead of the math department, thinking about Maybe, you know, again, shortening that sequence, that developmental education sequence, and thinking about how we can get students into college level English um, with co requisite support. And there's national examples of that working um, at other institutions. So, the mapping, we have graduation maps. And if you look at other uh, colleges that talk about the fact that they're doing pathways reform, their graduation maps look a lot like the graduation maps we already have. So we're not talking about doing new curriculum unless you are in fact engaged in revising your curriculum, right? Um, the maps are about how do we think about those co-curriculum, the supports, the high impact practices, how do we map them on to the course sequences that we're recommending to students and making that more visible. And also by making it more visible, sort of auditing ourselves, right? Um, do those things in fact exist in our programs? Um, and do they exist in predictable and structured ways? So we're kind of beginning this conversation of how do we enrich in our understanding of what those maps could be. Um, I'm not going to read all of this, but these area completion councils, which are still, I think, very much, I think our thinking is in progress on this, but the deans have this idea of folding this work into the school curriculum committees rather than having it be an extra group. And they would meet and they would have data driven conversations about what are the attrition points in their areas and specific programs and what might be done to kind of like address student attrition in their areas. So it's a very grounded, hopefully pragmatic sort of set of practices that can evolve within school curriculum committees to address issues that faculty and academic administrators and advisors are seeing um, in those areas. And, um, by the end of this academic year, there should be a more fully developed proposal about that. Um, the English department is working on co-requisite support led by uh, Joanne Giordano um, and a group of faculty. They're doing great work on sort of really thinking through what would it look like for a student who maybe uh, test just below, right? Places just below uh, college level writing, how you would move that student into a college level like an English 1010 course and maybe have an extra credit of co-requisite support um, to uh, help that student succeed and maybe move them more quickly uh, through the pathway. The math department has done phenomenal work. It, it deserves more than one bullet, but unfortunately I didn't have the, um, I had to do the whole thing, but the math department has really let out on developmental education reform and really thinking in, I think, inventive ways about 
student intentionality and what kind of math courses they ought to be taking depending upon the area and the pathway that they're in. Um, I think the math department deserves a lot of credit for leading out at this institution in some of that work. Um, and placement testing has undergone. There's been a lot of thinking about how do we do placement um, at the institution. That's a really important point in a student's sort of entry into the institution, whether they go into developmental education or into a college level course and how that happens. Um, there's been a lot of reforms there with, around self-placement specifically. Um, I already talked about we're developing general transfer uh, in those two areas. Um, lead advisors for each area are now participating in the pathways design teams. Um, group advising for impact, impacted programs is now available both virtually and in person. So they're doing virtual advising and have some, seen some success with that as well. Um, general education governance uh, has just sort of been reformed. I think we can expect those changes to be enacted next year. Um, and then there's been this mapping signature assignment uh, project that's been sponsored by an AAC and New Pathways grant, um, where faculty have decided which of the gen ed learning outcomes map to signature assignments in their area. And then I'm going to pause here with program review and prioritization. And I'm going to look at the chat again because I see some stuff happening here to make sure there's no. Oh, this is Rachel. Okay. Yes, Woot math for sure, Ron. Good job, Rachel. Okay. Um, program review. So program review is, you know, when you're when you have a program within the Utah system of higher ed, it's been you're required to review it every five years. It goes through this review process. Um, we were behind actually at the institution. We'd kind of um, we'd fallen behind with our program review process. I think it needed a fresh coat of paint. We needed to kind of revisit how we do program review. Um, and again, I think Rachel Lewis deserves a lot of credit. Her office led out on um, really kind of revisiting how we do program review, providing additional support. We now have a program manager, Brant Miller, who really does a good job of um, working with departments and schools to kind of like facilitate program review. And one of the big things I think that's different now is those, I think in the past program reviews, if, felt like they went to the void. They were sort of completed and shelved, and there was never any kind of closing of the loop. Well, now we have a kind of provost office response form. And we actually, when a program review is completed, um, the AD and the dean, and if a if faculty member lead maybe, will meet with the provost office. And we walk through, how does the provost office want to respond to this program review? And then additionally, that moves on to cabinet and cabinet has to respond to program reviews. So there's an effort to really use program reviews as an occasion to have an authentic and real dialogue about what is going well with this program, what needs to be improved. Honestly, does the program, is the program viable, right? Which gets into prioritization. Is this a program that has, whose time has come? Um, and that's what, you know, good colleges engage in that work on a yearly basis where they're always looking at their programs and asking themselves hard questions about, does this program, does the curriculum need to be updated? Is it sufficiently resourced? Is it over-resourced? You know, what's happening with this program um, and what, what do we need to do differently with it? So I think we're doing that a lot better now. We just sent a batch from STEM uh, to cabinet. We met and talked through all the programs um, a bunch of high level recommendations surfaced as a process of all of those program reviews being done together and cabinet has already responded um, to those recommendations. So I feel like that's going really well for the institution now. Program prioritization of this annual snapshot is this process of looking at your overall bank of programs every year and just looking at a very basic way of like, you know, some yearly kind of trends in terms of enrollment, completion, um, the cost per FTE of those programs. Um, and in a really basic way, just kind of asking yourself, you know, where are we kind of struggling uh, with our overall bank of programs? What programs are flourishing? You know, what do we need to do to support those struggling programs, et cetera? We are currently offered about, I think it's exactly 253 credentials. Um, I think it's worth asking, you know, how many credentials in the context of pathways, and you think about the, the basic idea of choice architecture, um, is that too many credentials? 
uh, for a college our size. Um, and I don't think there's an exact right answer to that, but I think it's something we need to talk about um, as faculty, as academic administrators in spaces like Senate, just to kind of be really transparent and open about what do we offer overall as an institution and what does it make sense to offer? And this is a recent headline from uh, Columbia College Research Center. They talk about the enrollment crisis nationally at community colleges that you've sort of heard about a little bit this morning. And they say, you know, colleges are just, they're talking about marketing and all these other sort of efforts. And their basic answer is have programs worth taking. Really think in intentional and honest ways about your program offerings and really double down and resource the programs that um, are worth completing. And they, they don't mean just in workforce. They're not totally just, if it doesn't lead to a job, it's not worth taking. They talk about transfer as well, but does that program lead to workforce in a meaningful way or does it lead to transfer, right? And it doesn't mean it just has to be a big program, but it has to be um, a healthy program. It has to be functional. Uh, and I think that's, those are, the, again, the conversations that Pathways is kind of leading us to have in better ways. Um, and this is a quote from that same uh, piece. And they talk about reevaluate, colleges need to reevaluate their program, programmatic offerings to ensure that all programs lead to outcomes that make them worth the investment of time and money by students and their families. So that's kind of an update for this year. Um, we, the collaborative work team will submit a report to cabinet and the college planning council. Um, we should have some map drafts by the end of the year, a proposal for those area councils, the general transfer degrees will have been designed. Um, and, and so I think it's, you know, again, given the challenges of the last two years, I actually feel it's a miracle that uh, people have been able to uh, accomplish as much as they have, uh, given the constraints we've been working under. I'm going to take a sip and keep going here. I'm going to do a time check. All right. So I wanted to just say, you know, there's areas where I think we're struggling, you know, with guided pathways reform. And I think it makes sense to just be open about that, right? <clears throat> So I think, you know, there's initiative fatigue, maybe at the institution and Pathways is, a, is one initiative among many. Um, we've been doing it for a while now, right? You saw that timeline and people feel like I have a, I have a colleague who's reported back to me that her son knows about Pathways, right? Because they talk about it at home and, you know, and the son said like, you're still doing Pathways? <laughs> so there's a kind of sense of fatigue whole college reform is hard, right? It's difficult to kind of coordinate a set of actions across different areas in a college as big as ours. I think there's different needs in different areas. I've been talking like, for example, to some of my career and technical colleagues and the structure hypothesis feels maybe redundant to them. They feel like they already have really tightly structured programs in a way that maybe my home area of humanities doesn't. Um, and so I think we, need to be more flexible in our thinking about what pathways looks like, uh, what the work needs to be done depending upon the area. I actually think this is something I've been thinking about lately, but that a lot of a lot of like higher ed reform talk is predicated on this kind of faculty and staff deficit thinking. So we talk about like student deficit thinking, right? Now we're we're not supposed to engage in student deficit thinking, which I agree with. Um, and I think it can be a challenge. Um, that we have sometimes. But I think conversely that a lot of the reforms are essentially in a very blunt way, the subtext of a lot of reforms is you're doing it wrong faculty or you're doing it wrong staff and this is the right way. And there is something, you know, I think the CCR research is really interesting and they're really smart accomplished scholars, but there is something fundamentally annoying about a group of scholars telling community colleges what to do when those scholars themselves do not work in the community college space. Um, so I take, I, I, I read their research. I think it's interesting. I think it's worthwhile. And I also get sometimes a little ticked um, by that fact that somebody from the outside, outside of the community college space is telling community colleges what to do. Um, I think that can be a problematic kind of scenario. And then there's, there's just, you know, I talk to colleagues who have reservations about the pathways model itself, specifically the structure hypothesis. They feel like it's, um, 
I've heard the phrase neoliberal, um, and and they have they have issues with that thesis. And I think we've had to we've had to work through those tensions, right? So I think those are some challenges that we faced, and that it made me think that maybe you know, even though I, I want to continue to engage in a lot of the research, maybe we need to think about what's our own vocabulary for talking about pathways work. I've been thinking about this because I mean, I you can't you can't force authentic reform, right? You have to the people like the faculty and the staff who are working with students have to believe in the thing that they're doing, or it's not going to be it's not going to be real, right? And it's not going to be terribly effective. So I'm really interested in just having good conversations with faculty and staff and academic administrators about you know, how do we talk about this in a way that kind of motivates interest and motivates the work? And I suspect that the kind of official CCRC vocabulary and framework, although intellectually solid, doesn't, you know, the phrase structure hypothesis does not get the juices flowing. I'll just say that, right? So um, how do we talk about it maybe in a different way? <clears throat> this was my uh, a couple of nights ago, one perhaps lame attempt to think about an alternative framing. Um, but I talk about rebundling. And if people don't know what the, the kind of uh, what I mean by that, in the last 10 years, there have been, this is just four examples, I've read three of them, um, of books that really are dedicated to this thesis that the way you need to reform higher education is to unbundle higher ed in some fashion, and specifically to kind of take apart that faculty role, right? To think about how do you kind of rationalize assessment, rationalize instruction, rationalize course design in ways that kind of break apart the faculty role to make it quote unquote more efficient, more cost effective. Um, and there's lots of examples. There's lots of, you know, venture capital and money dedicated um, to seeing this out as a business model. You'll see places like Straighter Line, right? For example, that are offering essentially unbundled gen ed courses that colleges can essentially buy and kind of fold uh, into their course offerings, right? I don't like this. I spent still most of my career at the institution as faculty. I believe not only in the whole student, but in the whole professor, right? I want to see um, the profession of teaching supported at our institution in an integrated kind of way. And those staff support, I want to see those professionalized and supported as well, right? Um, the advising, the career coaching, et cetera, orientation. So I don't, I don't wanna outsource what we do um, to uh, some company. I want us to simply do it better. And there's this guy, Randy Bass at Georgetown. He talks about how there's these forces of unbundling. And so that what higher ed really needs to do is to think about rebundling. Um, and Pathways, actually, the opening of Redesigning America's Community Colleges actually talks about that a little bit, about how, you know, if colleges are going to kind of resist those forces, they really, the, the, they need to swim upstream against that. And they need to go against the grain. They need to think about offering a much more coordinated, integrated, high impact experience for students, not just a cafeteria of courses. So I think about the rebundling re versus unbundling and that one way to think about pathways is us trying to offer a more coordinated, integrated kind of experience for students, trying to rebundle to double down on what we do best, which is really good teaching, really good student support. Um, so maybe that's one way to begin at least thinking about pathways. I also think about what motivates us, right? Um, these things do not motivate me. Uh, I, I recognize their importance, but strategic plans, key performance indicators, continuous quality improvement, these are not phrases that um, get me up in the morning uh, or that you know, make me excited. Um, I actually think that we have a very good institutional effectiveness office. I think that we do as good a job as any college I've seen, and I see other colleges, I'm an evaluator, um, for the Northwest Commission on Colleges and Universities. We do it as good or better than most of the colleges I've, I've seen. But that doesn't mean that it motivates you in terms of your work in your area, right? So I'm trying to think about what would motivate the work. Here's just a couple of books I've been kind of 
looking at lately. This is one, and they're both really interesting. They're both by social scientists. One, one is a set of sociologists and the other is an anthropologist, but they're essentially doing higher ed ethnography. They're just going in, rather than coming at higher ed with this kind of disembodied theory about how higher ed ought to work, what these scholars do is they go talk to students and they talk to faculty and they begin to form generalizations based upon those conversations, right? Um, so this is, was an award-winning book a couple of years ago, How College Works. Um, and they talk about, you know, fa faculty have this kind of cognitive bias, naturally so, right? Um, and curriculum is important, right? But it may not be fundamental. Good people brought together in the right ways we suspect are both necessary and perhaps sufficient to create a good college. So I really think about a lot the role connection plays, connection with my colleagues that I have, um, that you all have with each other, and then connections with our students, that that's so fundamental to um, a student succeeding. And, and that, that could happen, you could have the most tightly structured, rational program, but if there's no connection, um, that student probably isn't going to succeed. Versus you can have a program that maybe not is not so well designed, right? Maybe there are some design flaws in the program, but it's really high impact in terms of like uh, high touch in terms of that the faculty, the advisors, students feel welcome. They feel really connected to, in, to each other uh, and to their faculty. I think that that's an important way to think about our pathways work as well. Where are those, where are those points of connection? And this is another book I've been looking at lately. I love learning, I hate school. Susan Bloom is an anthropology professor at Notre Dame. Um, and again, a similar kind of book where she, she, rather than coming at higher ed with this idea of like an abstract theory about how it ought to work, she does this kind of ethnography. And she talks a lot about like fulfillment, meaning, motivation, the intrinsic motivation that we all have to learn and how institutions can sometimes thwart that and what institutions can do maybe better to kind of like tap into our basic innate human desire to learn. Um, and it's a pretty idealistic book, but it's, it's, it, it motivates my own thinking about this work. And she talks about human thriving and has this metaphor of trees, right? Um, uh, they'll seek to ensure this just as trees will bend to the light, no matter how many obstacles will put in their path. You've seen rounded trunks distort, distorted because the light is obscured. Many of our students are like those twisted trunks. They seek fulfillment and passion and meaning. So those are some ways that just little quick touch points of ways I think about how we ought to think about our work in the, in the context of pathways. And I think about just, these are just off the top of my head, but what, what, where are we actually spending our energies apart from officially sanctioned goals or initiatives? I see a lot of faculty authoring. Um, you know, like there's these open textbooks, like Lon Schiffbauer has this nutshell brainery YouTube channel um, that's like fantastic. Um, student leadership, right now student leadership's working on this student academic free freedom statement and they're just kind of excited about it. They're motivated about it. It's just interesting to see. There's really course redesign projects. These are two, but I know there's a lot going on, right? There's new curriculum and this just scratches the surface. I know that there, and again, this gets us out of faculty and staff deficit thinking. I know there's a lot of initiative that isn't officially visible with the institution, but is nevertheless happening with this institution. And we got to figure out ways to make that work visible and surface it and give credit for it. And then Pathways as an HSI initiative. You know, if we're being honest, I don't think Pathway HSI has been an explicit feature of Pathways. Equity has been. But not, but not HSI. I think moving forward, we need to think about how do we integrate that into pathways um, so as to avoid initiative fatigue. I think we need to about, think about how do we wed this work because as an institution, as faculty and staff, we can only take on so many more additional projects. So my recommendation, I'll say at the end of the year, is if we're really serious about going down the road of becoming an HSI initiative, we need to figure out how to fold pathways into that, not make it an extra thing. And with that, I think I'm done at ooh, 42 minutes. Um, I'm gonna look at the chat and read some of these things. Is there a way to see if a student 
is in the ESL program, Stephanie Hoffman asked, or a way to recommend that they be assessed to see if they are eligible. Um, Stephanie, my understanding is there's just been another, in the latest rounds of placement revision, that was addressed that um, one of the, and I need to go back and look more specifically, so I'm not gonna answer this very well, but I know ESL was, was considered in the latest round of placement revisions and that we are, um, that is a consideration in the placement process. Um, Ron, has there been any substantive feedback from students? How do they feel about having to choose an area? Um, I don't know the answer to that, Ron, um, off the top of my head. And if somebody does, they can feel free to put it in the chat. Um, I don't know that we've asked students about how they feel about that kind of initial entry point um, and being asked to choose an area. Um, it seems that Pathways has a couple of goals, retaining students, preparing students for college transfer or workforce entrance. Have any assessments been done on how we are currently doing? What are the KPIs for the effective faculty of initiative? I think the big one to uh, answer to that, Tyson, is um, uh, the completion, right? Pathways is uh, a strategy that is officially placed under the completion goal. And as you saw this morning, our completion rates have gone up. Can that be attributed to our pathways work? I don't think we can say, right? Um, but that would be the official sort of answer uh, to that. Renee, thanks, Jason, nice job. All right, and now I'm getting some thank yous. I hope, uh, you know, um, it's, it's sort of weird presenting on Zoom. So uh, I apologize if it wasn't ideal. I talked too fast. I hope I was at least clear. Um, and uh, thank you, I was way more people I thought uh, would join uh, the Pathways Initiative than, I mean, 60 something people. So thank you so much. Um, Aaron, is the number of credentials that we offer 253, is that higher or lower? It's higher than most community colleges, Aaron. Most community colleges are in that kind of 100 range. Um, we do a lot of embedded certificates, I think that pumps that up as well. We are big and that's part of it as well. Um, Rebecca Schumann, Pathways design teams. So every area has a design team, Rebecca, made up of faculty, academic administration, and uh, some student affairs personnel that are affiliated with that area where they're really looking at the curriculum and the supports in that area. Okay, well, I have to do this one more time now in person. So again, I thank everybody for joining me. I'm going to uh, take a break let my voice rest and get set up in the forum over at the South campus. So um, thanks everybody. And I'll see you on the flip side.